Um, it's good to be together. It's good to worship. Uh, we get to gather to hear from God's word, but we also get to gather because, and I was thinking about this this morning, because God has placed his, his spirit within us. And, and a part of gathering and part of the, the, the great thing about being able to gather, like a year ago we weren't, um, is that we come together and, and we receive God's spirit from one another. So it's, it's not just that, that we read God's word, because I can do that at home, and I do, and, and I hope you do as well. And, and we, we meet God in his word, and he feeds us through that, but he also feeds us through brothers and sisters, because he makes himself present in and through his people. And so gathering with his people is, is actually a really big deal, both so we can receive that, but also so that we can give, so that we can share this, this faith and this this truth and this presence of God that he's placed within us as his people, we share that with one another. So even saying good morning is an act of sharing God's grace and God's peace and God's love. So good morning. <laughs> it's good. It's good because our God is here. And so we gather and we worship and we begin this morning. Elijah expected Yahweh to meet him in worship, even on Mount Carmel. We expect the same God to meet us here. He was bold enough to pour water on the sacrifice once. We gather in the name of the Father. He was bold enough to pour water on the sacrifice twice. We gather in the name of the Son. He was audacious enough to pour water on the sacrifice a third time. We gather in the name of the Holy Spirit. Yahweh, the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was with Elijah. He is with us too. Amen. For our psalm this morning, it's a little bit different. We're going to walk through Psalm 46, but Psalm 46 is also the, the inspiration for Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress. The, the specific words sound a little different because one's translated from German, the other from Hebrew. But 
I think you'll notice the themes correspond to one another. So we're going to go one verse at a time and a couple of verses from the psalm at a time. But because it'll take a little while, I would invite you to sit as we sing the first verse of A Mighty Fortress. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the mountains roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress.
I forgot to note ahead of time, I was, I was going to let you know that that little word at the end of each part of the psalm, selah, S-E-L-A-H, uh, it's a Hebrew word that we're not quite sure how to, how to translate it. Uh, it. It means something musically. Uh, and so it, it points out something for the musicians who would have played in the temple. It's, it's not a, a word like a, a vocabulary word that, um, that, that we that we translate for that reason. It just sort of sits aside to the words of the psalm. Um, so it's rather fitting. Uh, we, we took those breaks in the psalm where that, that word selah uh, indicates something musical and we inserted a musical hymn and sang through it together. Would you please stand? Because as we've sung and as we've recited that psalm and as we've acknowledged the greatness and the power and the majesty of our God, that would be a fearful thing were we to assume we could come into his presence on our own merits. But we don't assume that. We know that it's only by his grace and through his forgiveness. And so we come in confession as we speak these words together. It's hard to relate to the bold faith of Elijah. It's easier to see myself portrayed in the widow, resigned to a hopeless end. It's easier to see my wandering heart reflected in the idol worship of Israel. If I'm honest, it's easier to identify with the selfish pride of King Ahab. If I ever see myself in Elijah, it's when he feels exhausted, defeated, and all alone. And yet, the God who spoke to Elijah speaks to you as well. The God who changed a widow's fortunes has changed your life too. The God who called Israel back from idolatry is calling to you. The God who defeated Ahab's pride is the one who humbles your heart. If, like Elijah on the run from Jezebel, you feel exhausted, defeated, and all alone, admit this and ask your God to forgive, strengthen, and encourage you. I confess that I am sinful. I confess that I am weak. I confess that I am slow to admit my need for help. Lord, help me. For the sake of your Son, Jesus, forgive my sins. Send your Holy Spirit to strengthen my faith. Heal my relationship to your church that I may not be alone. Let your presence and your voice bring life to me. When Elijah was troubled, God did not come in wind, earthquake, or fire. When Elijah was weak and afraid, God met him in a low whisper. This same God meets you in your confession. He does not overwhelm, he will not overpower, but he will change you. This is his promise. Jesus died for your sake and because of his death and resurrection, you are forgiven. God has sent his spirit to strengthen your faith. He's given you a place with brothers and sisters who truly are your family. Like his servant Elijah, you can live boldly in the grace and the strength of your God. Amen. You may be seated for our hymn. You were the word at the beginning. One with God. 
First reading today comes from 1 Kings 19, and this is the continuation of the Elijah stories that we've been walking through the past several weeks. And so this story here, uh, this segment of Elijah's story, uh, will be the basis for our message. So you'll, you'll hear more about this in a little bit as we get into that. But let me read for you 1 Kings 19, beginning at verse 9. There Elijah came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehalah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose, went after Elijah, and assisted him. 
With that story in mind, I encourage you to listen to the next two readings as Dave Mueller comes up and reads for you uh, from other parts of Scripture, knowing that these other readings were chosen because they have something in common. Not because they tell the same story, not because they refer to this story, but because there are people or events or encouragements or rebukes that might be parallel. And I mention that so that you can listen and meditate on those things. And each of you might come up with something different, and that's okay. We'll allow God's word to work as it will. First reading is from Romans 8, verses 31 to 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Is it God who justifies? Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, or distress, or persecution, famine, nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Would you please rise for the reading of the gospel? The gospel this morning is found in John 20, verse 11 to 18. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not, not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. Here ends the reading. To be seated for the next hymn.
When I was a kid, we called it battle ball. It was one of the games we would play on the playground at the school I attended, St. Paul's Lutheran in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And it, and it worked like this. Uh, we had a big asphalt playground, but there was a, a rectangle painted, a couple of different spots you could play. Uh, but it was a large rectangular area. You played inside of that and the dividing line down the middle and you had one team on one side and the other team on the other side and you had these red playground balls, you know, the kickballs that you used to play with? And you would throw them at each other uh, and you would try to hit the players on the other team and if you hit them with the ball, they were out. If the ball bounced before it hit them, they were safe. So you had to hit them hard. <laughs> Sometimes. If you threw it at somebody on the other team, though, and they caught it, you were out, the person who threw it. Not only that, though, if they caught the ball, the rest of their team came back into the game. So you'd play back and forth, and you'd eliminate, and people would come back in, and you'd eliminate, and people come in. But eventually, you got to this point, usually, where it came down to one side had just one player left, and everybody else was knocked out on their team. And it was down to that one person. They were the last man standing. And all eyes were on you. And every ball from the other team was coming at you. <laughs> it wasn't always my favorite place to be as a kid. <laughs> In some ways, in some ways, I think Elijah might have felt a little bit like that. <laughs> the last man standing, all the pressure on, all, all the, the, the energy of the, of, the, of the match, if you will, pointed in his direction and wondering what in the world is going to happen next. That's what's happening in today's reading as, as we open up and as God meets Elijah. Elijah even claims to be the last man standing, doesn't he? In order to get the most out of this part of the story, even though we've read through it once, I want to work through it bit by bit with you today as well. So, those opening verses, we read this. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. That's Elijah. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. You ever felt like you were the last one standing your ground? Maybe you can relate to Elijah. Maybe you can relate to my battle ball story. Or maybe you have a story of your own. One example that's current, I suppose, is this. It's been, it, it really has been, I think, pretty lonely for Christians in political conversations lately. When everything is a battle between left and right, but your views don't neatly align with this side or that side completely, and yet you feel this pressure to be a part of this group or that group because we, we want to be with somebody, and yet, by all rights, we really do kind of stand alone. And that can be pretty lonely. And, and, and when I mentioned loneliness, some of you might be thinking, well, we covered that last week, didn't we? And, and, and we did in, in some ways. We, we covered some of that ground. We talked about isolation last week and the, the, the isolation he was feeling when he, when he went into hiding after Queen Jezebel had threatened his life. And yes, we are going to talk about some similar things today. But that's probably a good idea. See, it reminds us that when we're walking with friends who are hurting, it takes the time that it takes. It reminds us that when we care for family members who are grieving, it will take the time that it takes. These things don't move forward on the schedule that we choose. And God shows us, I think, in today's story that he realizes this. Walking with Elijah through his hurts and frustrations and, yes, his isolation, it's going to take the time that it takes. There's no schedule and there's no deadline. It's going to move forward a little bit at a time and it'll take as long as it takes and God doesn't seem to mind. God said, go out, stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. 
You know, I, I looked at several different English translations for that low whisper to see how they take it. And I, I found all of these. I found gentle whisper, still small voice, gentle blowing, soft whisper, voice of a gentle breeze, whistling of gentle air. It's Maybe from that you can tell. It's, it's maybe a little bit tricky, bringing it over from the Hebrew. But, but really, why do I point this out here? Because it helps us slow down and appreciate what God is doing for Elijah. See, Elijah's still hurting. He's still struggling. It's been 40 days since his, the last encounter he had where the angel of the Lord showed up and we talked about that last week and he, he sustained for this journey he's going to make to Mount Horeb. It's been 40 days since that happened, but Elijah, in many ways is in the same place. He's still alone. He still feels all alone. And God comes to him once again. Not with scolding. Not with a call to change. God is not in the powerful wind, nor is he in the earthquake, nor is he in the fire. He's not in those things because he hasn't come to destroy. Now, make no mistake, God always, always comes with power because he is God. But for our sake, sometimes he chooses to cloak his power in weakness. See, when God arrives in power, the power overcomes every obstacle, wipes him out. He, he moves forward and it doesn't matter what stands in his way. And, and Psalm 46 talks about that, what we read earlier, right? A mighty fortress is our God. When he comes in power, you know it. When God arrives in weakness, he doesn't come with the power to overcome. When he comes in weakness, he comes to empower his people and to build them up so that we can face obstacles. And that's what he does for Elijah. God hides his power so that he can become Elijah's power. And when Elijah heard this, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? It's the same question as before. So do you think God doesn't know the answer? Did he forget what Elijah said earlier? I mean, you think about it. If God knows all things, then, then why does he ask Elijah this, this question? Not once, but twice even. I think it's because our God really wants to listen to us. He actually wants to hear from his people. He wants to hear our prayers, our concerns, our hurts, our frustrations. See, your God wants to listen. And so he asks the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says the same thing, right? He says, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. I mean, listen to Elijah's complaint. Does it sound familiar? If you're a parent, you've heard this before. See, I, I grew up with a sister. And, and as a kid, I would, I would regularly make my parents aware of those things which just... Okay? I mean, why do I always have to take out the trash? Why doesn't Mamie have to do it? Why do I have to mow the lawn? That's not too far from Elijah's complaint. He's got a certain perspective, and it's the Elijah perspective. And his focus is kind of like my focus as a kid. I, I only wanted fairness when fairness meant things got easier for me. That was my complaint, and it sounds a little like Elijah. I've been very jealous for the Lord. Those other people, they've been rebellious, and I, even only I am left. And now they want to kill me. Now, granted, the death threat was real in Elijah's case. But, but as I pointed out last week, Elijah is conveniently forgetting the fact that there's been a death threat on him for three and a half years where King Ahab was seeking to kill him and God has protected him throughout that time. So God's got his back. Elijah's complaint is very self-centered. It's borderline whiny. Still, it's honest. And God has asked to hear him speak honestly. In fact, I would say that God loves honesty when his children speak to him. 
And Elijah's complaint is not the only example of this type of honest prayer in the Bible. It, it actually sounds a whole lot in, in its tone and the way you place things out. It sounds a lot like the book of Lamentations and the prayers that are offered there. It, it, it echoes in some of the Psalms that have a similar demeanor to the or complaint brought before the Lord. And those are recorded so that God's people, us, we can learn how to pray. So we can actually learn how to pray like Elijah, or we can learn to be honest with what I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing and bring that to our God. Because our God wants to hear. He wants to hear what's happening in our lives. He wants to hear how we're processing it, if you will, how we feel about it. Even if our feelings, in some way, might be a bit self-centered, he still wants to hear. And he wants to listen, even when our hearts are hurting. He wants to listen, especially when our hearts are hurting. So it's God's invitation to Elijah in this case, but it's Jesus' invitation as well. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So Elijah brings his complaint to God because God wants to hear it. God asked him, and Elijah was honest. So how does God respond to Elijah's honesty? Well, essentially, God says this. My plans are still moving forward, and my plans include you. My plans are still moving forward. You, you might not be able to see it, and it might not be so clear, and you just laid out some things that tell me you don't see it. My plans are still moving forward, and my plans include you. Listen to God. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mechelah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. I'm still at work, God says, and so are you. And that's God's message to Elijah. Now, remember, I said that God arrives in power in order to overcome obstacles. But he arrives in weakness in order to empower his people to meet obstacles. My plans are still moving forward, and my plans include you. God brought this message to Elijah as he arrived in weakness, in that still, small voice, so that Elijah would know that this was a message of grace. God was not coming to overpower Elijah with his strength. God was coming to empower Elijah by his strength. The foreshadowing of what God would do for for all of us, for all of his children. See, when God came to earth as a savior, he didn't come in power. He came as a human being. He came as a, as a new life formed in the womb of Mary and born as a little baby. God made himself fragile and vulnerable. Jesus, God's own son, was ridiculed and mocked and beaten and whipped and crucified. It was the ultimate example of God coming in weakness. See, God did not reveal his power on the cross. He revealed his love. God became weak for your sake. He allowed all these things to happen in order, that, in order to save you. He was separated from the Father and he was given over to death so that you never would be. See, God became weak enough to enter your death so that you be empowered by his life. Because Jesus rose from the dead and he offers this new life to you and to all who believe in him. And by faith, we have this new life. We live this new life. We're empowered in this life that Jesus has given to us. Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to his church, to his people, to empower us to walk in this life. That spirit is present with you and his power is working through you to bring salvation to this world. And this, too, is God coming in weakness. The fact that he chooses to use us to share his love, to share this story, to share, to share what he's done with other people. And yet there are glimpses of his power, aren't there? 
I mean, there's the apostles speaking at Pentecost. Uh, glimpses like the advance of the gospel around the globe. Glimpses like brothers and sisters receiving God's promises in the waters of baptism. And in, in watching that miracle take place, glimpses. But more often, our God still arrives in weakness. Because the apostles who spoke at Pentecost were sinful men who passed away like all men do. The people and countries who've received the gospel around the world still struggle with greed and corruption and selfish ambitions. And we, who've received baptism, we have nothing that this world would label as power. And still God is present. He's at work. He arrives in weakness in order to empower his people. In the, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have the ultimate affirmation of God's message to Elijah, God's message to us. My plans are still moving forward, and my plans include you. So with that in mind, let's, let's continue with Elijah's story. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah's not alone. The numbers aren't huge. In fact, they're pretty small. It's, it's less than a quarter of 1% of Israel's population. But he's not the only one. Elijah needs to know this for two reasons. First, he needs the encouragement from knowing that he's not alone. And second, there are others who need the encouragement of knowing they are not alone. See, Elijah needs a community. And that community needs a prophet. Together, they remind one another that this is not the end. They need the reminder that God has given to Elijah. My plans are still moving forward, and my plans include you. Now, at the close of today's reading, we start to see Elijah's response. God's come in weakness. God's come to empower. God has come with his grace to Elijah, and he's given this message, and we start to see how Elijah responds to this. So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them, boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. God has spoken. So God's people respond. He's reminded Elijah, he's reminded us that his work's not done. He's reminded us that, that we have a part in this work. His work may be cloaked in weakness, but his work is still moving forward. So how do God's people respond to this? We step up. We step into the, into the roles that he's given us. For Elijah, this meant continuing in his role of prophet. That's the role that God had given to him. It's the, it's the relationship he had to the people. He would call forward a couple of political leaders. It's the anointing going on there. He would call forward these avengers who would carry out God's punishments on the unfaithful leaders of Israel. But he would also call forward a prophet. He would call on Elisha to fill his role for God's people. And as God gives this instruction to Elijah, there's something else implied here that I'm sure Elijah picks up on. His time is short. His time as prophet is, is coming to a close. He's choosing a successor. He's not done serving yet, but his days are numbered. And Elijah is called to be faithful as he finishes. You and I respond. The same message given to Elijah is given to us. Our God's plans are moving forward, and, and we have a place in those plans. So, so what do we do? Well, we step up. We step up to the roles and the responsibilities that God has given us. Are you a son or a daughter? Are you a father or a mother? Those roles are full of responsibility. Are you a brother or sister? Are you a neighbor? Are you a church member? Start taking inventory of the responsibilities you carry that those titles reflect. In your roles, in your relationships, you have a responsibility to care for people. You have a calling to, 
to steward property, to leverage ownership for the good of others. You're given opportunity to share what you have and what you know. And in this way, you glorify God and you take part in his plans. Plans which include you. Elijah responded to God's encouragement by being faithful to the word God gave him. And so do you. So do we as God's people. Because the same God has come to us. He's come in weakness. His power hidden so that he could empower us with the same encouraging message that he gave to Elijah. My plans are still moving forward. And my plans include you. Amen. Continue with our song. We do bring our, our gifts, our tithes, our offerings as a, an act of our worship. Uh, we, we don't pass a plate. Uh, there are a couple of uh, drop slots uh, on your way to the church, uh, back to the church entry. Uh, you'll find a, a place there where you can drop off an offering if you have brought that as part of your worship today. Um, and as we bring ourselves and our lives to our God as part of that offering, uh, we pray together over our offering. So would you please pray with me? With thankful hearts, we receive from you, O Lord. With thankful hearts, we respond. Receive our thanks and praise. Receive our offerings. Receive us as your own. Amen. This morning we have uh, three quilts, three prayer quilts, uh, that we want to we wanna pray over some individuals who will receive these. After church, uh, you'll be able to stop by in the courtyard and finish one of the ties on the quilts, uh, which are meant to symbolize and represent the prayers of God's people. Uh, and so we'll join our prayers together for three different individuals. First, for Kent Frazier. Uh, this is Eileen Frazier's son. And Eileen this morning wanted to uh, offer a thank you to our Calvary family for praying for Kent. He had uh, surgery this week. That's gone well. He is at home recovering. Um, and that'll, that will take some time. He had hip surgery. Uh, and we want to pray for his healing. Uh, and his comfort uh, as we pray for his quilt. Uh, we also want to pray, uh, one of these quilts is for Chuck Stevenson, uh, requested by Audrey Owen. Uh, Chuck has been diagnosed with colon cancer, so we pray for his healing, for his peace and comfort. And uh, we want to pray for Lester Johnson, also requested by Audrey. Uh, Lester is recovering from a heart attack, so we want to uh, pray for, again, his physical health, for healing, for recovery, uh, and that, uh, that Lester would know God's presence with him. Would you please join me in prayer? 
Father, we come to you in prayer because you've asked us to share our requests. And this morning, especially, we pray for these three individuals who will receive these, these quilts and these signs of your people's presence, of your presence with them. We pray for Kent. We pray for Chuck. We pray for Lester. Uh, for all three, Lord, we pray for healing. Uh, we pray for recovery. We pray for, for you to be at work in their lives, caring for them physically, but also caring for them spiritually, that they would know your presence, that they would know your power, and that they would know your love. Let your children, let all three of these sons of yours know that you are with them and that God's people walk with them, that you are working for them and that you have good plans for them. May they rest in that assurance and may they grow in that hope. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We also want to pray for one another and, and any other requests that you have this morning. So I would love to hear uh, any prayer requests that you have for yourself or friends or family. Start over here. Please stand for prayer. Father in heaven, when Elijah was still hurting, uh, even after 40 days, even after meeting your angel and still feeling that isolation. You came to him not to scold him, not to ridicule him, uh, not to tell him to change, but you came in weakness, in that still small voice, in a gentle whisper, uh, and you came to encourage him. You came to build him up, and you came to prepare him for your work, which was continuing to move forward. And you wanted to hear from him. You asked to hear from him. And so, Lord, we, we come in that encouragement. Uh, we come because we've seen that grace shown to us in Jesus Christ. And we come because we believe you want to hear from us. And we bring our prayers, we bring our lives, we bring our concerns to you. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks, Lord, for, for Anne, who is home and recovering. We give you thanks for answering prayers on her behalf. Continue to be with your child and continue to care for her, Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks for Dave Mueller and for his birthday coming up. And we pray that you continue to watch over him as your child. Continue to uh, connect us together as community and as family and allow us to walk in your grace and your love, Lord, in your mercy. Father, we give you thanks for answered prayers on behalf of Edward, um, that, uh, that you watch over your child. Continue to care for him. Continue to make him aware of your love and your presence and your power in his life, Lord, in your mercy. Father, we lift up our brother Kevin, our sister Mary. We pray that you would strengthen them. We pray that you would care for them physically. We pray that you would care for them spiritually as well. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for Maria, that you would relieve the pain in her shoulder, that you would watch over your child, that her physical therapy would be beneficial, um, that, her, that her knowledge of you as a heavenly father and as a loving God would be... Uh, more than beneficial. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for Zachary. Uh, we pray as both of his kidneys have failed, as he is waiting for a transplant, we pray and we wait on you. We wait on you to meet the needs of your child. Let him know your presence. Let him know that you are with him. Let him know that you love him. Care for him and provide healing for him, Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for Mary with her hernia surgery coming up this week, that you would watch over your child and that you would indeed provide healing, that she would know you are with her. Lord, in your mercy. Father, watch over Blenda and Paul as they travel uh, overseas. Uh, keep them safe. Uh, let them know your presence. Uh, let them know your calling. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we pray for Lisa, that you would relieve her of the, the pain she's experiencing in her back, that you would bring healing to her body, uh, and that you would be present with her, even at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for Cindy, uh, who is at home uh, with a cold, with back pain. Um, grant her relief of the physical pain and ailments and aches of bodies. Grant her healing uh, and grant her peace in your presence and in your love. Lord, in your mercy. 
Father, we pray for Dan with his knee replacement coming up this week. Watch over him. Keep him safe. Uh, allow the, the doctors and nurses and those who care for him uh, to use the expertise you've given, given them uh, to bring healing to his body. And we pray that you, yourself, would indeed uh, in bringing that healing uh, and caring for him and watching over him as your child. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we pray for Rick uh, with surgery coming up this week. Again, Lord, work through those surgeons, those doctors, nurses, and those who, whom you've given these skills and abilities to. But beyond that, Lord, be at work yourself in his life to bring healing to his body, uh, to bring comfort and peace to his soul. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray as well for the life family at the loss of a father, loss of a grandfather. We pray for, uh, for us who grieve and mourn uh, at the loss of, uh, of friends and especially at the loss of Henry. And we pray that uh, as family and as friends gather this week, um, that you would be present uh, to bring comfort and peace to hurting hearts, uh, to speak your gospel message to those who may have forgotten uh, and to bind us together as your people um, that we may support one another as we walk through the trials of this life, knowing, knowing that you have a life far better uh, in store for us. Lord, in your mercy. We offer all these prayers, Lord, and we bind them together. We bring them to you knowing and expecting that you hear and that you will answer. And we pray together in the words that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. When Elisha took up Elijah's role as God's prophet, he cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And the Lord was present with his prophet Elisha. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah, today? He is with you and with me, even as we go from here. Yes, he is. The Lord has sent his spirit to us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. You may be seated for our closing song. has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes are open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can't do There's not a mountain that He Praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. Nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing that our God can't do.
is not a prison wall you can't break through. Who oh, prays a name and makes a way? There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh, oh, oh. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like the power There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that God Amen. Amen. You can sit for my announcements, though, because they're not that important, I suppose. Let me grab, I don't want to forget, because I wrote down several today. Uh, there is a Bible study taking place following worship in the library that's straight across the courtyard outside uh, the book of James, walking through that. Uh, and you can show up, you can wish Dave Mueller a happy birthday, uh, and you can <laughs> study James together. <clears throat> Also, we have potluck tonight. Uh, so it's, the, it's our third potluck, uh, and it's our final potluck. So if you've missed out, you should show up tonight. Uh, bring a dish to share. If you don't have a dish, just grab a bag of Doritos, bring that to share. That um, We'll be in the parish hall from 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, and if you haven't been there, we will speed you up on where we've been. That doesn't really make a difference. Uh, but we'll wrap up things on spiritual gifts. Uh, and so we'll have a meal together. We'll spend the time, and we will look at spiritual gifts and what our God has for us there and how he empowers us in that way to be a part of his work. Uh, and then the last thing I want to mention, uh, I included in our prayers the Lye family. Uh, of course, Henry Lye passed away, uh, it would have been, what, a, a week ago Friday? Uh, Friday. Um, this coming Friday is the memorial service for Henry. Uh, and so our Calvary family is invited to be a part of that. Uh, that'll take place here at noon in the sanctuary, followed by a meal in the parish hall. Now, the meal is what I need to talk about as well, because Margie uh, said she would help coordinate some things kitchen-wise, but um, food is being provided, but uh, we said we would help with serving 
uh, and just setting things up, cleaning up afterward. If you can help uh, with the, the meal service, uh, dishing things out and uh, all those kind of things, and given the setting we're in and how restaurants are operating currently and some of those stipulations, we'll be, we'll be serving the meal. Uh, so we're looking for volunteers who wear masks, wear gloves, uh, people walk through and tell you what they want and you'll serve up a plate for them rather than doing a buffet style uh, because you're not allowed to do that anywhere else. So we're not going to stretch that and say we're better than everyone else. We'll just serve food for people and we'll serve them in that way. Um, so if you can help with that, please talk with Margie. Um, but as well, uh, if you can attend um, and be here for the live family and walk with them um, and maybe be here for yourself as well, uh, Friday at noon is the, is the service for Henry Live. Are there any other announcements this morning? Very good. Go in the love and the peace and the grace of God knowing that his plans are moving forward. His plans indeed include you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.